Assalamu alaikum, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Yasid, uh, Yasid actually invited me tonight, so this is going to be my first time uh, checking out the brothers tonight, checking you out tonight. Nice, nice. Um, did he send you the um, the a copy of the PDF book of the Alchemy of Happiness by Ram Ghazali? No, sir. No, sir. I'm going to put my email. Let's see. Blake at gmail.com. I just put it in. Usually give a few minutes for everybody to pop in, so I'll go ahead and send you a quick copy of that uh, PDF. Do you want this class? This was pretty good. I'll go ahead and pull up the pages that we'll be reading through. So, um, as we go through the document, we'll be able to read along, inshallah. Inshallah. And right when we finish up, um, I'll get your info and get the full copy sent over to you. Yeah. Open up with a quick prayer, of course. That's a lot more like I'm to everyone else popping in. Place in DD once a day. That's the prescription from, <laughs> from the shake suit. Place in DD uh, once a day. If you got the PDF, the Arabic or the English transliteration, if you can, uh, would definitely read send DD once a day for Sheikh Ahmed Ubamba to put the names of so many prophets and a couple of uh, scholars in here and throw a a few verses in to beseech Allah to send blessings upon his mother and to to ease everything that she has uh, coming up for her in, in her life when, when she was here in the flesh with him as well. This is also a good one to read or to play in mind also, especially when it gets to that point. And then say quick do I and inshallah I get some of those uh blessings of love within this Kasai sent on to the uh to the mother of your respective families inshallah. Oh, you heard Shakespeare say it a couple of times, but parts of Sufism are definitely uh, feminine in nature and principle, uh, esoterically speaking. But without further ado, 
a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani ar-rajim la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi wa huwa al-adhiyyul alim al-fatiha bismillahirrahmanirrahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin ar-rahmanirrahim malik yawmiddin iya kana umbudu wa iya kana astain ihdina siratal mustaqim سيرات الذين رمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد يا الله ذي المصطفى سندد يا الله وبك لليك ابراهيم يا الله يا الله ذي المصطفى سندد يا الله وبك لليك ابراهيم يا الله يا الله ذو المصطفى سندد يا الله وبك لليك ابراهيم يا الله وبك لميك موسى صالح قادر وبك شعيب واسماعيل يا الله وبسليمان النور يونس الياسين وزكريا يا يهود يا الله هارون يوسف الياس وادم داوود وزيد كفلي سلوت يا الله ويوسف وابشاك وغيره من الانبياء ورسل لك يا الله وبيل ملائكة تورن سوما صوفاتهم جبريل سوما بميكايل يا الله وصاحب النات إسرائيل كابد يا وحيل كالا إسرائيل يا الله وبي صحابة سوما أولياء ما أن وأهلينا من الأخبار يا الله وبي صديق وبيل فاروق سوما بزي نورين سوما بي سبتين يا الله بمالك انزل ما يشاء في يدي هنيفة نحمد المحمود يا الله بالله والكلام ما فوس سوما بياسك اللزيم وبالكرسي يا الله وبالقرآن وبالتراث وكاسد سرين توبا سوما بدا رودا جابي هو روح يا الله بالكسرين بالكسلات وتسليم يا له الله وعلي وسافي وازواج يا الله بالاس بالله نعلين ربيا في أتان وحبلنا نقصت في الدارين يا الله وَقَفْلَنَا كُلَّ بَعْدٍ كُنْتَ فَاتِحَهُ لِسَالِهِنَا مِنَ الْخَيْرَاتِ يَلَّهُ وَأَسْلُكِنَا نَجَارُسْتِنْ وَأَكِلَ رَزَنًا وَأَرُدْنَا وَالْجِنَّ وَالشَّيْطَانَ يَلَّهُ وَكَامِلًا كُلَّ مَنَّهُ وَأَنَكْسُدُهُ وَهَبْلَنَا كُلَّ نَامَكَارِ يَلَّهُ وَأَرُدْنَا كُلَّ تِسَابٍ وَأَسْرَدِيرٍ وَيَأْسِرَنَّ كُلَّ تِتَاسِيرِ يَلَّهُ وَتَوْمِلِنَ أُمْرَاسَ وَأَدَامِ أَنْ رُولَا دِئِنْ تُرُوبِنَا كَوْلِ وَاسُلِنَا يَلَّهُ يَلَّهُ وَكُنْ لَنَا عَاسِمًا مِنْ كُلِّ مَلَكَةٍ وَنَاتِنَا مِنَا بَلْدَا يَلَّهُ وَأَفْتِنَا أَخَدِ مَا قُسَاتَهِنْ مِنْ حَنِنْ فَزَالَتِنْ فِي شِدَاتَ فَقْرِ يَلَّهُ إِحَانَةٍ كِلَتٍ مَا تِلَتٍ غَلَبٍ وَأَفْتِنَةٍ وَالْبَرْكِ مَسَارِكٍ وَالْقَادِ يَلَّهُ عَارٍ وَالْبَرْدٍ وَالْنَحْدٍ كُرْبِكَةٍ نَرَمٍ جَلَالَةٍ وَأَرْجٍ وَالْقَامِ يَلَّهُ وَحَمَّةٍ وَكَتَّ يَدَّ لَا تَعْزَلَنٍ وَالْمَسْكِ وَالْقَلْبِ سُمَا خَسْبِ يَلَّهُ وَقُلَّةٍ مَا جِنُّوا إِتْنِنَا جِلَّةٍ مَرَدٍ زُمَا جُيَا يمنع لك كل شيء إن خادر ولا عجل الذين مستوى بالخير يلاه إني سألتك قلبا خاشيا متوادي أن وإلما كثير الناس يلاه إني سألتك قلبا خاشيا متوادي أن وإلما كثير الناس يلاه إني سألتك قلبا خاشيا متوادي أن وإلما كثير الناس يلاه وطالبة كبلت ونكمة رفيات مزاجة سالحة في دين يلاه وكن مويزا لنا ما شرف حسد وما شارف من وشار لين يلاه وشار سيغ وشار كالك نيسهم مجنهم ولا ثوات سام يلاه إنا جألتك في الدرين يا تكتي حسنا حسنا فاكن ملجاي يلاه فلا تكل نيسا لنا في فاهلك كن أجيب الثيني حتى وما تكو يلاه وجلسان وكلب تاكري كما أن إن دم ما تمال إيمان يلاه ثابت يكيني في قلبي بلا وجلن أتاؤلا أتاؤها ديك الله حق يلاه ولجل موتا رافة وما فرحة 
in kulli sharin wa karbin daka ya lahu wa fatli ya jisma khaisuhu fairukani fil karbi la tubli yan hula ya ya lahu wa kum nasiri an hasi ma dafanu jismi fasiltu wahid dan tama ya lahu la tatmu mana imana kad yura wi uni balikti yan kula ma shakahu ya lahu wa najini wa jami al muslimi na ma'an wa najili wa damita imina ya lahu Wakfil lana walaha wastud maha ibna Wautu fiha wa biha fil hawli ya lahu Ahas tajawa wa inyanna hama fama Laha siwaka antal bar ya lahu Bi barzakin ma karbin kun lana wa zara Wa min guru bin wa kawfin naji ya lahu Lak tak tabiha biha la say bika diratin Wa la tukhayyib rajaha fifa ya lahu Was ahkina maa min maa'i kawfariman Iktartahu min jamil khalki ya lahu Man kanna yuasituhu wa la kiyuku Ta kufrin wa suru man yakshaka ya lahu Muhammadin maka ilyari ka idina Lijana tilkuldi yawma al-hashri ya lahu Alayhi salli wa sallim da'iman abadan Wa man kafuhu li yawmi dini ya lahu Alayhi salli wa sallim da'iman abadan Wa man kafuhu li yawmi dini ya lahu Alayhi salli wa sallim da'iman abadan Wa man kafuhu li yawmi dini ya lahu Subhanu rabbik rabbil dizati ya mayasifun Wa salamun ala al-mursalin Walhamdulillahi rafil a'ilamin Parke sura in salu, 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 parke sura in salu. Here we are. The way he put this together is almost like the supreme wisdom, y'all. You can just read the titles of the chapters and then get the, the essence of the book and then turn around and go back and read the book. Wait a minute, I remember when he said that because it goes in a, a, a pretty auspicious order, right? If we go back, the, the first chapter was knowledge of self then in the quran it said that he who knows himself knows his lord so in the next chapter chapter two was knowledge of god because once you read the chapter of knowledge of self once you read your book a little bit more knowledge about god which is that that second chapter which of course not knowing that kind of have to have a, a heightened knowledge of this world also lining up with certain quranic ayah as well as some teachings from Sheikh Ahmed Obama through a Kasai or two here and there. <clears throat> but based on what, what the, the two words that he starts with, this world, this world uh, from Arab, from English to Arabic, if you see it in the Quran, it would be um, uh, al, al dunya. Uh, dunya is, is this world or the material world. And that particular word, dunya, or world, is written in the Quran, uh, it's repeated in the Quran exactly 115 times, right? <laughs> this is the, 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 the beauty of the mastery of that, that holy book. The Quran places a lot of emphasis on the, the temporary and the fleeting nature of life in this world compared to the, the eternal life of the next world or the, the next chapter, the next day of no how, how deep you, you dive into uh, the esoterics of it. But 115, like why 115? I got to thinking about that and actually had to dive in and do a bit of uh, 
math. Islam is mathematics, and mathematics is Islam, right? So dunya is in the Quran 115 times. This, this world, uh, a stage or a marketplace, passed by pilgrims on their way to the next one. So that should give you a hint at what chapter four is going to be about, right? The book we just referenced, the Quran, has 114 surahs, which we, you know, study a little bit of Pythagoras, a little bit of the golden ratio. That 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 number in those surahs indicate or hint towards the the golden ratio. So the world and the afterlife exist after. Quran. Quran was already in existence in the law of Mahfus or the, the hidden tablets, right? So after that, the word dunya is repeated 115 times. They wouldn't have repeated 114, so it, it equals up exactly to, to that because it can't, right? For this material. SubhanAllah. That word is repeated 115 times. Imam Ghazali says about it that it's this is right here that these pilgrims that he's speaking about in the first sentence are able to provide themselves with provisions for the way. Or to put it plainly, man acquires here by use of his bodily senses, right? Some knowledge of the works of God and and, and through these, 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 this knowledge and, and this these works of God, the sight of whom will constitute his future beatitude through, through the person attaining both of those and then marrying both of those together to to constitute his future beatitude. So and we probably heard that word from the from the Bible, um, beatitudes. Um, beatitude can be looked at or defined as a a state of supreme happiness, bliss. Felicity, nirvana, enlightenment, through the nature, the great pop. Now you be you, God body, right? So it's it's for the acquirement of that knowledge that the spirit of man has descended into the world of water and clay. So as long as his senses remain with him, then he's meant to be, or is said to be, in this world. When they depart and only their essential attributes remain, he said to have gone to the next world. So as long as your senses remain, as long as I identify with the, the body today and I wake up tomorrow and I'm, I'm still identifying with the body and then the, the physical senses that I, I apparently think that the body is actually feeling and doing. I'm now binding myself to this material where work realm in in this world. Or consciously, he's speaking about a, a materialistic level of understanding about things, or or materialism, right? And that's how a dunya and shaitan are the four enemies that we get taught to overcome on the path. The nafs, ego, hawa, carnal passions and desires. So it's something in this world, whether it's those passions and desires or something he egoically lusts after when he was here, or materialism, or just pure devilishment that binds him to that lower state of consciousness, always in that particular state of consciousness. But when that particular state of consciousness departs from the person, right, and he comes into knowledge of self, he, he comes into uh, a, a book as, as, as beautifully, as beautiful as the Quran and, and really opens himself up and reads it open-mindedly, open with an open heart so that the dhikr that the Quran is, he polished the heart while the person reads it. But as long as you identify with that body, you're down in the material. But if we identify that spirit, this part that's on the inside of this body that's looking at these black lines on what we call a white screen or a white paper, I'm transcending a, a, a few things that not too many other people might think about, right? 
So identifying as that indwelling spirit, it, it raises the person's understanding to the, the the plane of the soul, vibrates a little bit higher with you know some some new age talk, right? But Iman Ghazali goes on to say that while man is in this world, there are two things that are necessary for him. The first is the protection and the nurture of his soul, and then the care and nurture of his body. That's as esoteric as, it, <laughs> as it's going to get, right? Because that reminds me of a Bob Proctor quote when he he was speaking about this knowledge of self, and he was kind of, you know, he, some people may say he might have been poking fun, but he was saying, you don't, you don't call into work and say, body, am sick. Body isn't going to make it in today. Uh, not identifying with and as the body you call in and say i am not feeling well i am not going to make it in today but if we go back old testament time frames when god spoke to moses through the burning bush what did he say his name was when he told him to go back and someone asked him like man who sent you man i said tell him i am i am that i am i am that's who sent me proper nourishment of the soul above as he was saying is the knowledge and the love of god and to be absorbed in the love of anything but god is the ruin of the soul so the knowledge and love of god shaykhaf lubamba his religion is love of allah and love of the messenger the messenger comes with the knowledge of God, love that messenger, and of course, the the, the, the source and the fountain of that knowledge, where that, that messenger came with it from, which is which is thus God, is where else could it have, have came from, right? So I love these analogies that he he, he, he paints through right here, because it really makes you think a little bit deeper about this flesh space suit that a lot of us are wearing right now. But the, the body, so to speak, he says, is simply the riding animal of the soul. <laughs> it's, it's the thing that you are, you are, you, you're riding, and it perishes. But the soul that's on the inside of it endures. The soul, now that you know, or the person would know that's who he really is, she really is, should take care of the body, just as a pilgrim on his way to Mecca should take care of his camel. But if the pilgrim spends his whole time in feeding and adoring his camel, the caravan is just going to leave him behind and he's going to perish in the desert, might not make it. So it's that, that old adage, right? You know, first our line, the entire camel, like, broke from camel's face, neck, around post or, or tree, maybe. But rely on your higher self and its connection to Allah and knowing that there was a messenger that came down with something that you couldn't have got from yourself at all to give it to that soul that's on the inside so that it knows how to act and uh, em embody the, the principles of the teachings with that body. So use that connection and that chain from that, that, that beloved messenger of ours, may peace and blessings be upon him and his connection to Allah. The shortest sisla or, or chain, but be most powerful. And, and use the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, zigzag zig, to take care of the, the body that we have while Allah is inhabiting it, right? Because Allah does not fit in the heavens or the earth, but he does fit in the heart of a true believer as it says in the Quran, right? <laughs> I bust out in a rap verse, y'all. Don't laugh at me. But man's bodily needs are simple. <laughs> man's bodily needs are simple, being comprised under three heads. Food, clothing, and a dwelling place, just like Kujo Goody said, right? I do it for my people, like David. And Goliath, off with your head, everybody start a riot. Sick and tired of excuses, people, get your ish together. All you really needed was food, clothes, and shelter. That's good, Imam.
fire. I've been on Goody Mob Binge for the last few days, but the bodily desires which were implanted within this man, right, within these these three heads, <clears throat> are a view to um, procuring these. Uh, those those are apt to uh, rebel against reason. Those bodily desires that are in, that are Im implanted within us are. You can say um, variations of the the knife seagull or lower self or any of the four enemies that are going to make you rebel against reason or to or make a person rebel against reason, which is of latter growth than they because they can't they can't grow at all. Knives can't can't get any higher than the knives. Howard can't get no higher than Howard. Dunya can't get no higher than Dunya because after Dunya is over with, after the world's over with. Nothing will be left but the face of Allah, as it says in the book. But while those things are in existence, or they they exist to us, and they they hold more weight than than things we're able to uh, to get in the hereafter, or they hold more weight than what we're able to do for another person that just might not have do for themselves, right? Accordingly, as he said and saw above, those bodily desires implanted in this man or in, in, in man, people, they require to be curbed and restrained by the divine laws promulgated by the prophets. So considering the world, like he says, with what we have for a time to do, a little short blink, right? When you really think about how, how small the earth is and how big space is, we only have the concept of time because of the stars and the moon and the sun in this particular galaxy, but if we were to leave it, where would our concept of time go? So considering this world where we're at right now, which we have for a time to do, meaning we won't be here for, for, for a short time, we also find it divided into three compartments. Just like man was, as he said above, man is food, clothing, and a dwelling place, food, clothing, shelter, as basic needs and necessities or uh, provisions. But as far as the earth and the world, from this particular perspective, we find it divided in the three departments of animal, vegetable, and mineral, kind of like Rumi uh, put in, in the poem. Uh, I died as a mineral and I became a plant. I died as a plant and rose to animal, right? I died as animal and I was man. Why should I fear when I was less by dying? The products of all three of those, animal, vegetable, and mineral are continually needed by man and have given rise to three principal occupations, or let's say, yeah, occupations, because that we, we need to take these things and turn them into something that we can use to benefit or better ourselves or benefit or better someone else in this world with which we have for a time to do. It's just a just short amount of time, so it's best to do some, some, some good and, and some noble things while we're here. So these these three, the weaver, the builder, and the worker in metal, and he'll break them down that have sub subordinate branches such as tailors, masons, and smiths. And just like neither of those previous three can be independent of each other, animal, vegetable, and mineral, some cow has to go take a crap somewhere in the field to fertilize some seeds for some vegetables to grow from it. You dig uh, pretty deep in that soil and, and go way, way down, you'll find some precious minerals that the earth is just producing for us for free. All we have to do is put a little bit of something back in it, right? So this process continues to work. So like he says, none of those can be independent of each other either because they, they give rise to various business connections, like relations, and these are these two frequently afford occasions for hatred, envy, jealousy, and other maladies of the soul. 
because now we got three people who own businesses. These three people who own businesses, the Taylor, Masons, and Smiths, and one may want to have a bigger business than the other. So they put extra uh, lights on the outside to draw more customers in. So now it's, a, it's an ego battle between businesses is, is what he's saying from that perspective. Hence come quarrels and strife <laughs> and the need for a political and civil government and knowledge of law. I've, in that particular example of there's people that are relying on the earth to give us things that we need to produce things for ourselves and for others. The earth does it freely and, and in such the most in, in such a beautiful fashion and way that we can't even reproduce. So why would we then take something from the earth and in the process of transferring it or giving it to someone else, there's hatred or envy or or jealousy, or you see someone else uh, with a bit more than than what we might have. There shouldn't be any of those negative quality traits within the heart and mind, because those cloud the heart and mind, especially the, the heart, they're going to make those black spots appear on the heart they speak of in the Quran. They weigh the heart down, and the more black spots on the heart, the less susceptible that heart is to reflect the divine light of Allah. So if you go to the Hadith in, in situations like that, I think there's one where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said in the Hadith that it, it talks about brotherhood and fair business practices all right do not be envious of one another don't artificially raise the prices against one another don't be trying to get no cap and cap on top of the interest <laughs> stop for a lot uh do not hate one another do not turn one's back on each other and do not undercut one another in business transactions and be O servants of allah brethren Muslim Akhul Muslim. A Muslim is the brother of a Muslim. He does not wrong him. He does not want him to fail when he when he when he really needs him, right? He doesn't lie to him. He doesn't show contempt for him. Prophet Muhammad said at the end of that quote, piety is here. But when he was saying piety is here. He was pointing to his heart. He tapped his, his chest three times right over his heart. Piety is here, right? It is enough of evil for a person to hold his brother Muslim in contempt for anything. All Muslims are inviolable to another Muslim. His blood, his wealth, and, and most importantly, his honor. So if there was any honor in there, there, there wouldn't be that hatred, envy, and jealousy attached to these uh, businesses, attached to uh, parent businesses and production that are relying on animal, vegetable, and mineral that Allah through the earth is giving us for free. All we have to do is put a little bit of something back in the earth. Thus, the occupations and businesses of the world have become more and more complicated and troublesome, right? chiefly owing to the fact that men have forgotten their the real necessities. Their real necessities are only three. Also, the clothing, the food, and the shelter. And these only exist with the object of making the body a fit vehicle for the soul in its journey to the next world. So if I don't have food, clothing, and shelter, I have to use my, my heart and my mind to figure out how to make my body be able to do something to get a little bit of income, to get some clothes, get some food, save up some money, uh, get a nice little house to rent. I'll get a part-time job. That's what I can go do. And I can get some more money for food and clothing. I can buy some more clothes and have a house to put everything in. And I have to make sure that I myself, like mentally, am fit to work whatever job I apply for. When I apply for, I got to make sure I do it my best. And if it's something that requires physical labor, I got to make sure my skinny self puts on a little bit, <laughs> a little bit more weight. I feel like it's coming from a state of not having food 
clothing and shelter can be looked at as this world a person is in that particular state, right? And as soon as this person comes into uh, or requires ooh, clothing and shelter, that's heaven to that person on earth. To him, it feels like he is in the next world. He's not attained those things, right? So, but he's saying that that quarrel that he was talking about in the paragraph above for the people that kind of bicker in between each other and whatnot over Lord knows what, when what we have or what we're probably bickering about is something material and everything material we have, we only have because our law created the elements for us to even use to create the things that we have. So it says people like that, they've fallen into the same mistake as the pilgrim to Mecca that he talked about above who he forgot about the objective of the pilgrimage himself. He forgot about the essence and the spirit and the meaning of going on Hajj. He should have spent his he should have, he spent his whole time eating and adorning his camel. And what was he supposed to do when he gets there is get off of it and tie it up. He was going to walk away from it and everybody else is going to walk away from theirs too. So who was going to be looking at his bedazzled camel with all the, the, the jewelry and the, the gold and trinkets hanging from it? All right. Unless a man maintains the strictest watch, he is certain to be fascinated and entangled by the world, which the prophet, peace be upon him, said is a more potent sorcerer than Harut and Marut from the from the Quran, right? And the, to frame that that last sentence, unless a, unless a man maintains the strictest watch, he is certain to be fascinated and entangled by the world, which the prophet, peace be upon him, said, the world is a more potent so sorcerer than Harut and Marut. And those two angels are described in Surah Al-Baqarah, second chapter of the Quran, uh, verse one, verse 102, about uh, they were teaching magic to humans in the city of Babylon, which is present day Iraq, essentially. So that was the, the reference about the, the world being more of a potent sorcerer than Harut and Marut. So no matter what those two angels were teaching, no matter what type of magic they might have been teaching to those people in Babylon, the dunya, the, the world, the material world, materialism is a more potent sorcerer than those two angels. Alhamdulillah for teachings from Sufi masters like Sheikh Ahmed al Bamba, Qadr Sirahu, that give the specific weapons to use to overcome and cut off the head of those four enemies, the Nafs, Howard, Dunya, and Shaitan. Alhamdulillah. Because he says the, the deceitful character of the world comes out in the following ways. In the first place, it pretends that it will always be with you. How devilish is tough for her. While as a matter of fact, it is slipping away like it mentions in the Quran, this, those who took for their religion a sport and a pastime, and for whom the life of the world has deceived. So this day, we have forgotten them, even as they forgot the meeting of this, their day of judgment, and as they used to deny our signs. Goodness gracious. In the first place, the world pretends like it's always going to be there and it's always slipping away. Quran even gives us reminders about it being fleeting and fleeting meaning always slipping away. Like, if, if, has anybody ever had one of those dreams where it's like you're chasing something or you're running away from something, but no matter how fast you run or bump your arms and move your legs, you get further and further away from what you're running to? Like you never get close to it. That's, that's that's what the world does. No matter how fast you run to it, you never really get to it at all. Moment by moment, 
it tends to go away, like you said. It bids you farewell, like a shadow, which seems stationary, but it's actually always moving. Again, the world pretends itself under the guise or the disguise of a radiant but immoral sorceress pretends to be in love with you, fondles you, and goes off to your enemies, leaving you to die of chagrin and despair. Pause. Chagrin is a it's a state of it's a state of distress or embarrassment or or ha having failed and being been humiliated while while you failed. So that's what he uh that's what that word chagrin means. So what he's saying is that the world will, will come to you in a disguise of something that looks like something glittery and something that you would. Uh, more than likely would like to have possession of pretends to seem like you can actually possess it gets close enough to you just so you can almost grab it and then it runs away to go do the same thing again to your enemies to leave you feeling uh distressed or more embarrassed that that that, that tried to try to grab a hold to the, a fleeting world like quran says and and you have to watch it turn around and run away so, uh, Jesus, Isa ibn Maryam, upon whom be peace, alayhi salam. He says, he saw the world revealed in the form of an ugly old hag. I think this one's in, in some Islamic teachings also. Uh, he asked her, how many husbands has she had? I remember this this ugly old hag is, is represented by this, is, is the world. The world is represented by this ugly old hag that, that Jesus, peace be upon him, is, is being encountered by. And he asks the world, the, the ugly old hag, how many husbands have you possessed? The world, the ugly old hag says that they are countless. You can try to count to the number, but you'll never get to it. All right. Then Jesus, peace be upon him, asked her whether they had died or whether you, you got divorced. Like, that's a lot of divorces if I can't even count to it. And the world, the ugly old hag, said that she had slain them all. I marvel, he said, at the fools who see what you have done to others and still desire you. Nafs, ego, our carnal passions and desires, they want of something. Dunya. It's probably something materialistic, material. The world sh shows up kind of like a bright and radiant princess, but the world is actually an ugly old hag. There's a reference to this in Surat Ali Amran, where uh, it says, beautified for people is the love of which they desire of women and sons and heaped up sums of gold, silver, fine branded horses, cattle, tilled land. That is the enjoyment of worldly life. Those are also some of those things you, you need to have. You, food, clothing, shelter, the animal right, was a part of that, that particular uh, buildup of those three on three on three. But Allah has with him the best return the sorceress decks herself out in gorgeous and jeweled apparels and then veils her face and then she goes forth to seduce men too many of whom find they follow her to their own destruction of stuff real life when when jesus peace be upon him as i has also said i marvel at those who see what you have done to others and they still desire you and they, they see you let Roman around the corner to his destruction because of how you're trying to approach me. And you think, I don't want after you. Mm -mm. The prophet, peace be upon him, has said, the day of judgment, the world will appear in the form of a hideous witch with green eyes and projecting teeth. <laughs> 
men beholding her will say, mercy on us. Who is this? Oh, Lord, who is this? <laughs> but the angels will answer, this is the world. This is the world for whose sake you quarreled and fought and embittered one another's lives. He's saying when you finally wind up seeing what it is, kind of like he said, the Mary above was equating it to the, the ugly old hag that tried to make herself appear radiant. Prophet Muhammad speaks of it in a similar fashion that the, the, the world bedazzles herself, but then puts a veil over the ugly part so you can't see it. And then when you figure out who it is, this is it. That's the world for you. You quarreled and fought, argued with your homeboy and yelled at your neighbor about something petty and material. And then this, this witch with green eyes and protruding teeth will be cast into hell. Watch out now. Because from down there, it says that she'll cry out, Oh, Lord, where are those my former lovers? Those that were always trying to come get at me. God will command that they be cast out after her. Just spent the, the entirety of their life facing her, and, and more and probably not once, not once, did Toba turned back to Allah. Right? This is where we get Tuba from. The root letters in Tuba and Toba, turning back to Allah, or the, the feeling you get when you do and continue to stay focused on Allah, that bliss and that felicity is the, is the connection that we have here. <clears throat> That's a hadith in regards to how Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, looks at the world. And now that we've seen like it be it framed two different ways with the way Imam Ghazali was speaking from the perspective of but Jesus, peace be upon him, mentioned about this radiant princess uh, that the world is pretending to be is actually revealed as a ugly old hag that slain countless people. Same thing from Prophet Muhammad about it being a witch with green eyes and projecting teeth kind of bedazzled in certain spots but covered in the other. Sahul ibn Sa'ad in the Hadith reported that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, if the world was as worthy to Allah, get this, if the world were as worthy to Allah as the wing of a mosquito, an unbeliever would not even be given a sip of water. If the world was as worthy to Allah as the wing of a mosquito, an unbeliever would not even be given a sip of water. Because of I think if we were to take the wing of a mosquito um, after, after um, it, it's unalive some kind of way, possibly, <laughs> frozen a stock for a lot, and take that wing and put it up under a microscope and zoom all the way in, you'll probably see the most beautiful sacred geometry connecting that very thin film that we call the wing of a mosquito. And you see how beautifully composed the wing of a mosquito is and how much detail and precision and how much of Allah's self Allah put in that wing of a mosquito. A person who, who wouldn't believe in, in that even when being shown that clear sign is what he's saying would not even be given a sip of water. Because Whoever will seriously contemplate on these things, like think seriously, think deeply on these things and meditate on them. Like the past eternity during which the world was not in existence. There was a point in time when there was no earth. There was a point in time where there were no humans on earth. And the future eternity during which it will not be in, in existence. We'll, we'll see that it's essentially like a journey in which the stages are represented by years and the leagues by months and the miles by days and the steps by moments. Now, to chop there, to, to, to frame that at each and every single point of those um, now moments, right? that previous now when the world wasn't in, in existence and now the, the present present now, like right now, the world is in existence 
Scientists have done studies and yada 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 because they swear they're smarter than our lives that they know when the cataclysm is going to happen. But we do know what everything that is created is going to one day cease to exist. So the, the time when the world will be ceased to exist will also be now. Then, all right, because Allah doesn't exist in the past. And Allah doesn't exist in the future. Allah exists in the eternal now. Sheikh Sufi quote. Allah doesn't exist in the past. Allah doesn't exist in the future. Allah exists in the now. So with, with that thought process, what words then can picture the, the, the folly of man, the distraction of man who endeavors or works to make the world, the earth, his permanent home? And even has the audacity to form plans 10 years ahead regarding things he might not even need. He may never need, seeing that very possibly he might be under the ground in 10 days. Don't be so focused on things that are obtainable in the in the material life. Yes, there are things that we do need, food, clothing, shelter. There may be a few attachments to those, right? But I don't. I don't need a thirty-six inch, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve ounce gold chain with a, a, a big diamond encrusted uh, Jesus piece on it. Why? When I die, can I take it to heaven? I'm not gonna lie. Damn. And reasons like that is the why this this in this example. He's speaking of a person who's so distracted that he makes plans 10 years ahead, but doesn't focus on his now. Right? He's thinking so far ahead, but don't think about what he can do now to even ensure anything being better tomorrow. Right. This is why this is the perfect example of why it's it's it's, it's more than just a common Muslim etiquette to say inshallah. Right. Because we you, you, you never know. Are you coming over for the for the community celebration at the Masjid Ahi? It's going to be on uh, Tuesday, and it'll be uh, right after uh, Zur prayer. We'll have the food prepared, and uh, they'll have a bouncy house outside for the kids. Uh, are you going to come, Ahi? We'd, we'd love to have you. Inshallah. I don't. I don't. I don't know if it's in the the plan or the will of Allah for me to even be alive on Tuesday to to come to the celebration. I may want to go to that celebration. I might even have some good food that I can cook to bring to the celebration so I can participate in, in feeding the people and, and, and watching the, the, the smiles on people's face. But I can only go if Allah wills it. So inshallah, it's if Allah so wills it. If Allah so wills it. Well, I'm having to cook out on Sunday, man. We're going to be frying fish. Probably going to start at about 2 o'clock. And you come a little bit early to help us set everything up. Inshallah, uh, you know, whatever you may, you may have to do before then. But again, inshallah, then whatever the, the response may be. Because whatever I'm about to respond, I'm only going to be able to do that if Allah wills me to even exist at that point in time to be able to do it. That's what Iman Ghazali is framing here. Now, ooh, there's a few in this one here. You got nuggets everywhere. Those who have indulged without limit, stop rolling. Those who have indulged without limit in the pleasures of the world at the time of death will be like a man who has gorged himself to repletion on delicious viands and then vomits them up. He didn't eat all that good food and can't even keep it in his stomach. Mm -hmm. The deliciousness is gone. The food don't even taste good no more at that point. But the disgrace is still there. The greater abundance of the possessions that people like that may have enjoyed in the shape of Gardens, male, female, slaves, gold, silver, etc. Big rims on the car, flip flop paint job, peanut butter guts, iced out change. The more keenly they'll they'll feel the bitterness from parting from them. 
just like it said on the on the day of judgment, it said uh, Prophet Muhammad said on the day of judgment that when when it's happening, when when you're leaving your body and you you, you now know like oh, it, um, yeah um, um, the disbelievers will say nafsi nafsi, which means like, my self, my self, my body my body you're floating away from your body but the prophet peace and blessings be upon him will only say ummati ummati or my umma my umma my family my family for those followers of him and those who have said the shahada ashadu an la ilaha illallah now, he goes on at the last part of that first paragraph at the top. This is a bitterness which will outlast death. For the soul which is contracted, covetedness as a, as a fixed habit will necessarily in the next world suffer from the pangs of unsatisfied desire. So, not to make it all apocalyptic and, and whatnot, because I get what he's trying to uh to, to frame for paradigm switch. Since we're he's speaking of someone who's overindulged in uh, materialism and things that are attached to the four enemies, when the time comes for him to leave the body and he's trying to uh, possess or indulge in and take these things. Even if he's able to, those things will seem uh, horrible and uh, vile and disgusting to him, and he and he won't be able to enjoy them at all because he's he's no longer attached to it in that material body, material realm. He's transcending it at that point, and stop for a while. But whatever kind of hole he dug, that's 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 the hole he dug. But Hindu side. If, you, if your mind is focused on like Krishna at the time of death, at the time of death for a Hindu, time of death is reciting this sutras or time of death, he, 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 Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. His last thought, the last word, the last breath that comes from a Krishna devotee's mouth at the time of death, that Krishna devotee will attain Krishna Loka the, the 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 supreme abode of, of Krishna, if the person's mind is is honestly focused on any other manifestation of God in that system, that person attains that particular station in in the in the next life. But if that person's mind is focused on the material world at the time of death, if he reincarnates to try again. I don't know about y'all, but I don't want to try again. I feel like I don't want to. I don't know. No. Nur Muhammad Allah Sheikh Ahmed Obama Sheikh Ibrahim Janna Janna No more material world. Another dangerous property of worldly things is that they first appear as mere trifles, like, ah, yeah. but each of these so called trifles branches out into countless ramifications. Like, you can go off there and try to branch, break one off, but there's, there's, there's a, there's a, as a repercussion to to whatever that whatever action it is you're doing in regards to those those things that show up in regards to worldly things like that or continue to until they swallow up the person's time and energy. And double framed example, nope, let's talk for a lot. Triple framed example. Jesus, peace be upon him, the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Sheikh Afanu Bamba, Khadim or Rasul. All right. Jesus, upon whom be peace, he says, the lover of the world is like a man drinking seawater. The more he drinks, the more thirsty he gets, till at last he perishes with thirst unquenched. You got all that water in your stomach and you die of thirst. Running after worldly and material matters as such. <clears throat> Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has said, you can no more mix with 
the world without being contaminated by it, then you can go into water without getting wet. Mm. The parables of prophets will make you think, meditate on those guys. And I follow up in and frame that little quote from Jesus, peace be upon him, about the man drinking seawater, and he's still drinking, he's still drinking water, yes, but it's seawater, salt water. He's going to get more and more thirsty until he perishes with his thirst still unquenched with a belly full of water. And the prophet Muhammad is saying, you can't go out there and try to pretend like you, you know, above the world, but you really out there all in it. Because when you, when you try to come back, you're going to smell like the world. It's just like if you get into a swimming pool, you're going to get back out of it wet. Now, in the wisdom of Sheikh Ahmed Lubamba, he says that all desires, thoughts, and notions can be divided into three groups. All right, there are three groups that all desires, thoughts, and notions can be divided into. And those three groups are essentially three types of people, he's saying. Those that are focused on Allah, one. Those that are focused on the next life, two. Those that are focused on this world, three. But then Sheikh Hafidu Bama goes on to, to uh, expound and say, when they're focused on Allah, the seeker, the seeker of Allah, the one who has the will, drive, and volition to get to Allah, the murid, the seeker can attain or obtain the divine secret. Now, when the, the seeker is focused on the next life, right, they can attain or obtain the, the divine light that is going to show them the way to this, this next life, not to be cycled back and reincarnated, those that may believe in reincarnation. When they're focused on the material world, like God Obama says, the seeker will only obtain darkness and pain. Because the world is like a spread table, Elida, for successive relays of guests who come and go. Their gold and silver dishes, an abundance of food and perfumes, and the wise guest eats as much as is sufficient for him, as much as he eats, just as much as he needs. Like not once, as much as he needs, because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that the the stomach is is like this, holds up uh, the two fists together, and then says it's and it is also divided in three sections: one third for food, one third for liquid, and the other third for air. So this wise guest that he's saying eats as much as is sufficient for him. He puts those thirds in there, smells the perfumes, got the air. <laughs> he thanks his host and he departs, goes on about his business. The foolish guest, on the other hand, tries to carry out some of the gold and silver dishes. A star for a lie, brother. Muslims don't do such a thing. The foolish guest, on the other hand, tries to carry off some of the gold and silver dishes, only to find them wrenched out of his hands and himself thrust forth, disappointed and disgraced. You better hope he didn't get locked up or get them hands chopped off like they say people were doing back in the day. I don't know if that's true or not. We're here now, aren't we? So there's always uh, the, 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 these illustrations in threes. We got a captain and we have wise people with the captain. We got not so wise people and we got unwise people with the captain. So this illustration will we'll, we can kind of paraphrase. That's a long paragraph. Graph. He paints the picture of a ship arriving at a wood island. Captain of the ship tells everybody, look now, <laughs> we ain't gonna be here long. 
Like, we'll stop for a few hours here. We're going to be here long. So y'all can go there for a little while, but hey, don't stay too long. I'm captain. I'm the one that drives his boat, so don't stay, don't stay too long. So accordingly, all the people get off. They disembark. They go out on the island. The wisest people, right? the wisest people, however, they return after a short time when they find the ship empty. So they choose the most comfortable places in it, and they kick back and they relax. So I'm the one. I probably would do the same thing. A second band of the passengers, the second group comes back, and they spend a little bit longer on the aisle, and they're looking at trees and foliage and listening to the song of birds. So they are at least enjoying um, the signs of Allah and what they can see in the in the plants and the animals and the flowing water. But then they come on back after taking that in, and then they find the best parts of the ships are already occupied. We done already came back and got the best part, like Elijah Muhammad said yesterday, all these systems will get the best part. The best parts come back with the best part. So they had to be content with less comfortable spaces than the people who had the best parts. And the third party wonders still farther. Why? They do find some things, right? They found some brilliantly colored stones. They carry them back to the ship, but because they were late, their lateness in coming aboard compels them to stow themselves away in the lower parts of the ship. There was nowhere else for them to hold up at with all their rocks <laughs> and stones that they came back. And since now they're down there, those rocks and stones have lost all their brilliancy. They're not even that shiny to them anymore now that they realize where they're at in the boat. The last group, they go so far off, so far off. They didn't even listen to the teachings. Well, they might have listened to the teachings, but they didn't keep the, the teachings uh, repeated in their mind as a zikr. They didn't hold those teachings in their heart because the captain was speaking to them from a from from a from a place of, of, of care as well. We on an island and I don't know what's on the other side of all of that. So hey y'all please come back. We need a crew to man a ship. So if my crew don't come back, we won't have a ship. This last group got so far out that they couldn't even hear the captain calling to them. And he waited as long as he could. Captain waited as long as he could, you guys, and he had to sail away without him. So they wonder about for a while, and finally, either because no one knows, Captain sailed off. So they might have perished of hunger, or they fell prey to wild beasts, or they, somebody else might have stopped at the island, and they finally <laughs> got a got a ride. But Surah Al Ankabu, uh, chapter twenty nine in the Quran, verse sixty four, says. He, Allah, he, it is who will cause you to die and in time will resurrect you. And when the last hour dawns, those who have been lost in sin will swear that they had not tarried on earth longer than an hour. Thus they want to delude themselves all their lives, right? So even those last three, that last group, if they might have perished to hunger or might have fell prey to wild beasts, some there might have been a question that asked, how did this happen to you? How long, how long have you tarried there? Now that you're, you're you're here in the afterlife, how long have you tarried there? Not not longer than an hour. Because they were deluded their entire lives, just like that last group. What do you mean they, they left us? We were only over there for about an hour. We went over there and then we saw the tree had failed, but we had to go around the tree and climb over the hill and go down the winding path. And oh, that was a four hour journey. But that's why the captain left us. <laughs> right. So he frames that 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 picture by saying that the first group represents the faithful that kept aloof from the world altogether. Just like Sheikh Afnu Bamba says, there, there are three, those who focus on Allah, next life, or the world. So what he's saying is that this group represents those who in, in, in that, that case would be focusing on Allah. 
they kept aloof from the world altogether. They went out there and they came back. All right. They did what they were supposed to do. Right. And the last group, the infidels who only care for this world and nothing for the next. Mm -mm -mm. The two intermediate classes are those who persevere or preserve their faith, but they entangle themselves more or less with the vanities of things that are present. Because remember the first group, the wisest, they came back. They didn't come back with anything. They looked and they turned around and came back, right? Got the best spots on the ship. The second group, they wound up going out for a little while longer and they did admire a few things. They at least did take some things in, but they still listened to the captain and they came back. The third group, they wanted a little bit further. They found some things, brilliantly colored stones, nice little uh, little precious gems and whatnot. But it's, it's them, the second party and the third party he's talking about. Those two uh, intermediate classes are those who preserved their faith. Yeah, they did listen. They did come back. They did make it back. And one was almost late, but they came back. But they entangled themselves more or less with the vanities of things present. It's always a reminder in the Quran. Uh, one of the names of the Quran is at Zikr. It's uh, it's the reminder. So, it, and even it says in a, in a situation the current that that's similar to this. <laughs> oh, you who believe, what is wrong with you that when it is said to you, come out in the way of Allah, you turn heavy and cling to the ground. Have you become happy with the worldly life instead of the hereafter? So remember that the enjoyment of the worldly life is but trivial in comparison with the hereafter. So that last group that was out there just enjoying the uh, H-E-L-L -L out of that island, at the end, they realized how trivial that journey was to go out there and, and ooh and ah at a whole bunch of things that they couldn't even take back with them. Because in, in that case, in that picture that's painted, they're, they're supposed to, hereafter is supposed to be on that boat going back to wherever they're supposed to be going. But they missed their ticket. He said, Ibn Maryam gives us a reminder also. He, he, he said, be ye in the world, right? but not of it. Be in the world, but not of it. There's nothing wrong with going out there, but don't stay too long. There's nothing wrong with going out there on that island, but don't get distracted by the things that you see and try to bring as much as you can back. There's nothing wrong with going to that island, but don't try to go to the other side of it because the boat's not over there where we just came from. So although he's he said so much against the world, because I even said a stalk for a lie a few times, y'all just talk for a lie, because in this particular chapter he is speaking really, really heavily against the world. And in some of the the parables and the illustrations he puts, sometimes it might seem a bit harsh. You know, he said so much negative against the world. Some may say it seems, but he says it must be remembered that just like Jesus, peace be upon him, said, be ye in the world, but not of it. Imam al-Ghazali gives us a reminder and says that there are some things that are in the world which are not of it as well, such as knowledge and good deeds. All of those three things from at the beginning, the, the, the animal the plant and the mineral. If you know how to make or craft something with animal, plant, or mineral, you have knowledge of that. And then providing this thing you just created to someone who could benefit from it is a good deed. And the more good deeds you give, they get you somewhere. And, and, and honestly, esoteric that the person you give to in that nature gets the blessing too. Everybody gets blessings. It's like an Oprah Winfrey TV show. You get a blessing. You get a blessing. Everybody gets a blessing. 
So a man carries what knowledge he possesses with him into the next world, into the next state of being, into the next state of mental and spiritual awareness. And through his good deeds, and though his good deeds have passed, yet the effect of them remain in his character. So we may have went to go feed some people Sunday, and I might not be feeding people right now, but the the, the smile on my face right now, that matches the one that we had speaking to some of those people is is remaining. Like I'm not feeding those people right now, but the good feeling that I that I felt when I got a chance to just talk to humans, all right? Talk to humans and then help a human that didn't have what he what he needed to help himself and, and just and just chat like there's there's no difference between me and you. There's no difference between the sheikh and the disciple. The only differentiation between the sheikh and the disciple is that depending on the level of, of, of station of the, the shape moving as high up as goodness gracious, we have some very, very powerful teachers in our lineage. But the shape has realized or actualized his uh, divine self and is, is working to polish his heart and continue to polish that heart so that light continuously radiates out. He's always uh, seeking knowledge, trying to do good deeds as best he can. One of the deeds loved most by Allah is reading Quran, studying Quran, and teaching it to someone. Learning something about Islam and teaching it to someone is probably one of the things that can get you the biggest <laughs> lesson from Allah, upon the word Allah. Especially in this case with acts of devotion, which result in the Perpetual remembrance and love of God. That means at this point, at the end of this chapter of knowledge of the world, we've seen all these fleeting things. And what happens when we, you know, get too caught up in those fleeting things. But in this case, when we realize that there's supposed to be knowledge of these things that are in the world that aren't of it that we can do. And those things give us a perpetual remembrance of the love of God. Those are the good things that the Quran says does not pass away. So this is essentially why we be, we, we, we have to work as, as, as good as we can, as, as best as we can to em, em, embody the, the attributes of Allah, the 99. We, we have to work as, as, as hard as we can to the best of our capability to embody the 99 attributes of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And our thoughts and our words and our actions or deeds. Because insert Sheikh Sufi quote, a master is a master of thoughts, words, and actions. And those things there were in the, in the basics back up at chapter one with the uh, knowledge of self. And when we get to a, a perfect union of raising the lower self to the higher self through the seven stations of the soul and transcending these things at the lower stations, we reach Nafs Kamalia or the perfected self, the, the unity of Muhammad and, and Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And lastly, he says that other good things there are in the world, such as marriage, food, and clothing, et cetera, like there are, good, there are things in the world, but not of it, which a wise man uses in just proportion as they help him to attain the next world. Other things which engross the mind, causing it to cleave to this world and be careless of the next are purely evil, and were alluded to by the prophet, peace be upon him, when he said that the world is a curse, all that is in it is a curse, except for the remembrance of Allah and that which aids it. So bounce back to this first sentence of the good things in the world, such as marriage, being married before God, Allah, you have a, a, a such a heartfelt love for your, your, your spouse that you hold in your heart. 
Allah doesn't fit in the heavens or the earth. He fits in the heart of a true believer. And if that is reflected in your spouse, then Allah still doesn't fit in the heavens or the earth. Allah only fits in the heart of a true believer. If you're feeding people, like Shaykh Sufi tells us about doing all, a lot, like the bifolar, doing sun up to sun down. Even before COVID hit, there were some pictures online doing Ramadan while the Murid and the Baifal were fasting and in the masjid, the Christian society in Senegal were the ones preparing the food while the Muslims fasted. That is that, that, that remembrance of Allah and the action of doing that is what helps aid the remembrance of Allah especially that last one i wish i, I gotta go back and find that those those photos and, and and posts because it was it was beautiful to see people with zikr beads shaking the hands of people with rosaries or accepting food from someone that has a, a cross around their neck uh, but you have a, a kufi on or bull jalabia zikr beads and talismans or long story short christian muslim and a predominantly muslim society in regards to food, as Imam Ghazali is hinting at here. Doing this gives both of them the constant remembrance of God, especially if they are doing these things perpetually. Next year, Ramadan happens, pretty sure they're going to go feed people again. They're going to do it again next year, inshallah. I, inshallah. And just doing that aids the previous remembrance of Allah, the zikr, and makes it even stronger and clothing <laughs> if anybody wants to get into the industry study those by far brothers in Senegal study those by far brothers in Senegal study those by far brothers in Senegal if you want to if you want to learn from a master entrepreneur by far could have a business doing anything anything I know two that's that that vend at a, a local flea market in my hometown and one of them also works as a local dentist <laughs> like when he's not at the dentist he's at the flea market on the weekend vending african uh, uh clothes and these could be here and there for those that know what they are but he's dealing in clothing and the clothing that he's dealing in it's cultural for him it, it, it provides a remembrance of allah for him and when he gets to give this to a person who's trying to learn a bit more about Africa or trying to get some more uh, robes and jalabia so they'll have a proper Islamic dress to go to the mosque, they'll remember the experience they had with that brother. And, and just that is going to aid that person in his remembrance of Allah so that, inshallah, he tends to forget the material world and all those things that are in it. So it's a sneak peek. And of course, if we're going to go to uh, from knowledge of this world, next week we'll have knowledge of the next. Let's stop the share real quick. Just a moment to catch up on the chat. And Brother Akil, I haven't forgot you either. I'm getting my Google Drive to get that sent over to you as well. Before we wrap that up, in regards to um, knowledge of this world or understanding of this world or overcoming this world, Remember, the Quran always gives those hints about how fleeting it is. It gives us reminders of, of, of how no matter how much we chase it, it'll it'll run away, especially if, if we're chasing it for something that's attached to another one of the four enemies. We're chasing something material just solely for self. We're chasing something material for this new shiny, shiny thing. 
it's a, it's a, it's a new necklace. It's just some, just some 20 foes for the whip, dog. It's got the foes on the whip. We're chasing, chasing those things. And this is essentially what this particular chapter was speaking of about giving a proper example as why we shouldn't. And uh, the, the side notes and footnotes were references from the Quran, of course. Also references from the Hadith, of course. And also uh, a few uh, references from Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, of course, because Iman Ghazali always frame everything in threes throughout this whole chapter. But those three also had to be the resources for all the, the footnotes and, and references and, and zikrs and reminders. Just like that last part in that chapter, which I love so much. And I love, the, I, I love that he said that the way that he did, that there are some things in this world that are not of it. There are some things that we can uh, obtain in this world that that are not of it and there's nothing wrong with with uh seeking those things as long as while you're seeking those things seeking those things is going to be what gives you a stronger reminder or zikr or remembrance of allah or in the process of doing it you're perpetually continuing that remembrance so that now I put in a order with the shake at the flea market for another pair of Zikabees from the from Senegal with that all black wood. And I finally go get them. And then I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you. She cried, Shake. She cried. But on the inside, there's, there's something spiritual about it. You know, there's nothing to, to run around and, and, and boast about. It's, it's wood. All right. Granted, it is black wood. It grows in Senegal, Sudan. But the Jalamban is a very, very auspicious. It's a very, very important wood in the stories that are attributed to Sheikh Ahmed Bamba and Sheikh Ibrahim. So when framing it that way, it's not, yes, I have a new pair of zipper beads that I can do this and this and this, and I got these beads and I got these beads. Oh, no, it's not that. It's, I remember the story that Sheikh simply mentioned about these, this, this wood. The Sheikh at the flea market was telling me about how you can go so far north and you'll stop seeing this wood and so far south and you'll stop seeing it. And he even... He mentioned that the Chinese are reproducing this. So it's not um, an addiction to a zikr bee, right? Understanding it from that perspective is now, you know, elevated above the fact that it's a, 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 a nice zikr bead or it's a, a, a special wood. It, it, it is special. It's attributed to uh, stories that we hear for uh, about our beloved shakes. But Real talk, y'all. Chinese people, of course, they're over there in Africa. Stop for I'm not racist, but they're they're copying what they see us do over there. So the first time my Sheikh and uh Sheikh Umar at the flea market said he went back home and he was gonna re up on some more Zika be some more clothes and some talismans to bring back. He went to the market and saw a new store. And when he noticed what they had hanging, they looked a whole lot similar to a lot of the beads that that we we tend to wear and whatnot. But when he walked up to them, he noticed that these were plastic. The Chinese figure out a way to produce some sort of synthetic material to where it can be kind of shaved and carved down, and you can paint little things on it and make it look like this this wood that that means a lot. Because of, of of what's attributed to the to the shapes that we follow, and to bump into a plastic one, there's no spiritual attachment to it. At that point, this is what the shake is saying. At that point, there was no spiritual attachment. I went to the store and I was going to buy a bunch, so you can have some to send to so and so. But when I saw that's all they had, I, I, I couldn't. I don't know what those things are. Along the way, before we wrap 
up. Do we happen to have any questions at all? Is there anything throughout the chapter that stood out at all? Inshallah. Let's see. Oh, yeah, you're right, bro. I see it. Inshallah is critical. Um, I don't ever want to say I'm definitely going to go do something. And then as soon as I get up to go try to do it, I break my back or something. <laughs> like, I didn't even say Inshallah. But if our hearts and minds are clear, we'll do a quick close. Almost done translating this one. But we only need three lines because just those first three lines are so powerful. Alhamdulillah, Shukran, Jerjet, for those that came in. May we go forth and be successful in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> Rabbi Karimun was you and were you far to do, or was he let the Abdul the day he were far to do? Where they keep a far cry of Algazama Mahan, the Mustafa, Manga, Sabuhu, Ya Lustahu, Ya Rabbi Sali Al Habib, Mohammedan, while he was Harbi Makan for the Lu Subhan Rabbi Karadul is at the Mayasipun, was Salamun, Al Muslim, Alhamdulillah, he were Hilal Amin, or Kay Sidering Falu, or Kay Sidering Falu. For case it ain't follow, 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 for case it ain't follow. So I want like a boy love and light family. Yeah, what do? Yeah, Allah. Daddy Jeff Shake Sufi Ba. Daddy Jeff Shake Sufi Ba. Daddy Jeff Shake. Appreciate it. Dropping the jewels. No, for both.